So welcome back to the 32nd edition of the RCA Training Tip Show, where today I'm joined again by expert bike fitter Neil Stanbury, who's been fitting road cyclists for 10 years in conjunction with being a sports physiotherapist. In today's video, Neil is going to run through a complete bike fit, as in if you were to try and fit yourself at home, this is how you would go about it. And look, I've had a ton of requests on the channel from you, the audience, to do this video today, as many people don't have access to good bike fitters in their area, and also the COVID situation around the world has made things a little tricky. So Neil is gonna run through a sequence of critical bike fitting touch points step by step, and while outlining each critical touch point, I'll provide info cards that will pop up here. So as Neil is talking about specific topics, so cleat position, saddle height, saddle fore and aft, and also handlebars, you can deep dive on those specific topics by clicking on the pop-up that comes on the screen here, and I'll also provide links to those videos below. Now, I do have some channel news to share with everybody, and I wanted to do that in this video today, but just sorting through some finer details, I'm gonna share this channel news with you just after Christmas, and before we get into today's video, a few months ago, I had a bit of a pipe dream to see if I could hit 100,000 subscribers on the channel before the end of the year. I know it's probably not gonna happen, but they say Christmas is a time for giving, so if you get value from this video today, I know there's a ton of people out there that watch these videos that don't subscribe, please hit that subscribe button below, and let's get into the video. Yeah, yeah, you want this to be a 12 minute video? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 15 minutes max. <laughs> Come back in three hours. This, this, is a, this is a tough one to condense it down, so look, the massive amount of caveats at the start of this one. This will be a really oversimplified kind of process, which I guess by necessity it, it has to be um, because there's, as a home sort of, as a person who's trying to sort themselves out at home, it has to be overly simple. You just, the, the degree of, you know, minutiae of things that we go into when you're there in my clinic for three hours, you're never going to be able to replicate that at home. But if you wanted to get yourself roughly close. Yes. Um, what I would suggest you do, you, you will need a, a stationary trainer and your bike, obviously, if possible, some form of video recording because it's not ideal to rely just upon what you're feeling. Humans are, you know, cognitive bias and, and, and uh, you know, self-awareness of body position and motion is not equal among everyone. Some people have got great body awareness and they can sense a two millimeter shim under their right foot. And I met a bloke last night who couldn't feel the difference between no shim and a 14 millimeter shim underneath his shorter wow. leg. So, you know, it's, um, it's highly variable, you know, how, how well the person will be able to sense it. So some form of video, even if it's just your, your other half with a, with a camera phone, is, is worth doing. So there's, there's three kind of areas, like basic areas, where you want to break this down. You start with the things that you can control relatively easily off the bike, which is the shoe. Okay. Start and it, So sort out the foot, the cleat position primarily, then the pelvis, then the hands in that order. Yeah, And, and it, I don't always fit people in this order. If their drop is clearly 50 millimetres too low or too high, that'll be the first thing I'll change, right? I tend to start with the biggest problems and work my way down to the smallest problems. But if you're trying to do it home, at home, a sequence is a good thing to be able to work through. First thing to do, roughly set your cleat position, right? If the cleat's too far forward on the shoe or way too far back or something like that, it'll throw off other problems up into the position which you'll be unable to rectify. And this, we can do this before you even get on the bike. So we'll use your little splice bit of footage from yep. how I uh, found your cleat position and, and set it and measured it on the day. But essentially, find the joint line between your big toe and the rest of your foot. Just stick your fingernail into it. Once you've found it, mark it with a pen. Use your right foot for this. If your feet are different sizes, don't worry yet. That's a bit too far beyond the scope of this video. Okay. <laughs> um, but you, use it, base it off your right foot. Find the joint line, mark it with a bit of pen, and then tape a cable end or a little bolt or the, you know, a little section of a pen or something to it so that you've got a lump which you can feel through the shoe. Slide the foot into the shoe and then put a, I, I put a bit of tape over the shoe and just, just mark it with a pen or a pencil. So you've then translated where your big toe joint is relative to the shoe, yes. right? Take the cleat off the shoe, and I know the cleat is still on this one, but yeah. we're not gonna dismantle your shoes for this. Take the cleat off the shoe and put it on a flat surface, right? So your, your shoe will be flat like that. Use a business card. Business cards are ideal for this because they're a set square which can bend to oh. conform around the shape of your shoe. So stick it on a level surface, 
line it up with your mark that you've got and translate that mark using a pen. Just draw a line down on the on the tape that you've put on the shoe. Draw a line vertically down onto the sole of the shoe, and you'll and it'll it'll you know come out somewhere there, right? Yes. And then use a ruler and figure out roughly how far behind that point the middle of your cleat position is. Now, speed plays have got a little line on the base plate. Shimano cleats have got a tiny little notch on the side of the cleat. You might have to show some footage there if you can find it of someone zooming in there, a bit hard to find. And measure how far behind the center of your cleat is relative to your big toe joint. As a rough rule of thumb, if you've got a size 38 foot, aim for 10 millimeters. If you've got a size 40 foot, aim for 14 millimeters. If you've got a size 42, which a lot of people will have, that 42, 43, 44 range, aim for about 15, 16, 17 millimeters with the center of the cleat behind that mark, right? Don't worry about the rotational position yet. It's beyond the scope of the video. Okay. <laughs> Even the lateral position is something that's not easy to, you know, it's all about Q factors and so forth. So a yes. bit beyond the scope. Set them up the same unless your two feet are totally different sizes, in which case you may want the left and the right one to be staggered as a test. If your right foot's five mil longer than your left, you might want to try running the right cleat further forward on the shoe by five mils. You can try it both ways. Half the people with a foot size difference will function better with their cleat staggered and half of them won't. Yeah, so it's worth trying both ways just to see what the symmetry sensation is like. So once you've got the cleat four and a half position roughly right, Rig up yourself on the bike, clip in, have a bit of a pedal. The seat height and the setback are the next two things to look at. The center of rotation of the crank here and your pedal's going around like this. How high and how far back behind the bottom bracket do you want the saddle to be? This is, this is one of those tricky things. You sh a, a good way of doing it is to set the seat height with a combination of two things. One is using the techniques that we described in that seat height video lowering the seat and to, to a very low position and then creeping it up until the pedal stroke starts to feel a bit choppy and strange on one of your legs or both of the legs and then just come very slightly below that. On the video that you're going to shoot, you know, with your, with your iPhone or your camera phone, you should see a smooth, controlled leg extension. You don't want to see the person's knee or your knee. Yes. You don't want to see your knee chopping at the bottom of the stroke and losing control of the stroke. You want to see a smooth motion of the knee back and forth, sort of, sort of almost like a metronome. You want to see a smooth transition of the quadricep pushing down, extending the knee and the glute, and then the hamstring just controlling the bottom of the stroke smoothly. And, and those, the transition between those two things should be smooth. If it starts to get choppy, the seat is probably too high. So you wanna stay just a little bit underneath that. Now, mixed into there is the setback. If the seat is too far forward, you'll, you'll you know, yeah, and this is a hard one to judge because you don't know where the front end, is, front end is yet. If it's way too far out, the seat will feel like it's way too far forward and all this kind of stuff. Um, but you want to see, you know, that, that old thing, the, the plum bob kind of trick. If your knee is roughly over the center of the pedal, um, you know, on the downstroke, you, you're kind of, you're in the ballpark. It, it can be still 40 mil off, right? So I guess it's not, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big ballpark. Yes. <laughs> um, but what you then want to do is, is once the seat height is pretty close to where you want it, you think you've got control of the stroke. Start moving the seat forward and back and have a feel of what it does to your hands primarily and also secondarily to your pedal stroke. When the seat's too far forward, if it's at the right height, you'll start to feel really, really quad dominant. You know, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll feel like you're way out over the pedal. There'll be a lot of weight on your hands, probably a sign that the seat's too far forward. If it's way too far back, you'll feel really light on your hands, but you'll feel really hamstring heavy and the stroke will feel like you're not kind of getting over the top of the stroke and pushing down solidly on the pedal, that kind of stomp, you know, that push down that should feel nice and strong. You'll start to lose that when the seat is too far back. So what, what sort of pressure should somebody be riding while they're testing these things? Uh, yeah, it's a good, good question. Somewhere around your 30, 20, 30 minute load. Okay. So you, it should be done at a decent tempo. Yeah, yes. if they're cruising along at 50 watts, um, it's it. everything will feel heavy on the hands because there's gonna be more weight on your hands when you're cruising than when yeah. you're going hard. Um, so yeah, you should be pedaling at a decent clip when you're doing this, yeah? And bear in mind, you move the seat back the seat is getting further away from the crank. So as it goes back, you might have to, you might feel, oh, the pedal stroke feels a bit choppy again. I'll have to lower it a bit, mm -hmm. yeah? Or if it goes forward, you might have to raise it a little bit. And somewhere in a diagonal kind of plane there, you'll reach hopefully some kind of equilibrium where the weight to the front end feels not too bad. 
you feel like you're getting over the top of the pedal stroke quite well and pushing down quite strongly, but you've also got full control of the stroke and you feel at a decent load, you feel like there's a bit of hamstring load going on through the, through the bottom section of the power phase of the stroke. The hamstring is controlling the stroke quite nicely and you feel like you're in balance. There's no number that you can use. You can't say, oh, I'm this tall, my legs are that long, this is the number where I'm gonna start. Just start with the seat low, creep it up like we spoke about in the other video until it feels roughly right, and then start varying it. And trust in your judgment, you know, you go forward and you feel too heavy, you're probably too far forward, you know. Mm -hmm. If you, you go back and you start feeling strange, like you're not over the top of the pedal on the downstroke at that three o'clock position, you're not pushing down strongly, it's probably too far back. So trust in your judgment and use the video of yourself as well if, if you if you you stick it up on a, on a big screen and you go wow gee I look way forward I've got uh, I've got my elbows locked there are heaps of weight on my hands the seats probably too far forward yes. and you know you'll because because the people that are doing this at home haven't they don't have my experience of looking at thousands of riders from the side. They won't be able to immediately trust their judgment on what they see. They're probably better off going off what they feel as a judgment call. But if you've if you've got a good idea, you know what what a good competent cyclist is supposed to look like on a bike, you can use the visual indicator of the footage to say, oh wow, I look I look really far back, you know, I look really stretched out or something like that. Um, but but that's fraught with danger because what what looks good to one person might look bad to the next and, and so forth. And that kind of visual ability to, to troubleshoot a position based upon what it looks like in the first 30 seconds of looking at a person is something that takes a lot of experience. So yeah, it's probably best to go off what you feel, but also then verify that on the footage. So you've got a situation where you've got your seat height and your setback roughly right. And we're talking five millimeter ranges. It's pretty close to where it should be. The cleat position's pretty normal. Everything's going well. You're feeling pretty good. At this point, you then judge the hand position, right? So you will have hopefully found a situation where your torso, with everything in roughly the right place, your torso is nicely balanced at that 20 minute load. You've, you've got a situation where you can cantilever your torso out from your pelvis with very little load on your hands or very little projection of your shoulders forward or you know, shoulders are being pushed up, that kind of thing. And then all you wanna do is place the hood in a position and an arc of rotation. So it can be either high and a bit longer or short and a bit shorter, somewhere within an arc, which can span, it can be quite a big arc for some people, but it's usually a 20 mil arc of, of reach and drop. Somewhere in an arc there, you'll have a situation where your hand is on the hood, your elbow is bent you know, 20, 30 degrees. It's, it's relaxed is the point, it's not locked out. You look at, the, this is where the video footage can help. If your scapulas are being pushed forwards, they're being projected forwards, mm. it often but not always means the bars are too far away. Okay. So you, the, the rider will unconsciously do this to make their reach longer. What you ideally want is a more neutral shoulder position. If you're seeing this, they're probably too far away. So shorten them, bring them closer to you. Once you start to see the weight and you feel the weight come off the rider's hands, their elbows are starting to bend at that 20 minute threshold load, then start varying the height of the bars. You know, Don't be afraid to just, just go down, just drop it all the way down and see what it feels like. If you drop it all the way down and you think, oh, geez, I've got a lot less weight on my hands there, don't don't immediately assume that having the bars low on the bike on the front of the bike is is more aggressive. Let's say that you've got short legs and you might need you might need very little seat post extension out of the frame out of the frame because your your, your seat height is is quite low. If you've got short legs and a long torso, you may need to run the bars slammed on a race geometry road bike with possibly even a 17 degree stem just to get a reasonable amount of drop to the bars. Um, if you're highly flexible, there's a pretty good chance you're going to need drop, which will exceed 100 millimeters, you know, with the highest point of the seat down to the center of the bar. So don't be afraid to drop it right down and just, just try it. If it feels lighter on your hands and balanced and happy and, you, and your shoulders are relaxed and your elbows aren't, you know, locking out, it's, it's no, you know, there's no reason not to ride like that if it's comfortable. So the, the drop number, you know, how high the bars should be relative to the seat, it varies dramatically. And there's, you can't say, well, I'm this tall and, and, and I'm that flexible, so I need 120 mils of drop. It just, it varies too much. And arm length varies. So look for the weight on the hands. Look for the shoulders to not be projecting out. If they're projecting up, 
It often means that the bars are too high because you're trying to sort of unconsciously drop your torso down between your shoulder blades. If you're really just heavy on the hands and they're pushing back, it often means the bars are far too close to you, right? So play around with the front end. Um, and, and you know, if, if, if you find that you feel more comfortable riding in the drops, it's probable that the bars are too high. So don't be afraid to drop them down. You know, last last night, I, for example, I, I met a 60 year old bloke who was pretty inflexible. He, you know, he had bad posture, all this kind of stuff. The guy functioned best with 125 mils of drop to the bars, which is quite a lot. It's it's 30 mils more than I run, 35 mils more than I run. And I'm, I'm 20, 30 years younger than the guy and more flexible. And he, he had long arms and he, he bent forwards on a bike relatively well, deceptively well, given his lack of flexibility. So don't be sort of pigeonholed thinking, oh, I'm 60 years old, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to run 50 mils of drop to the bars or, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a lean, mean gymnast and I need to run 200 mils of drop to the bars. It, you know, it, it's, it's highly variable depending upon a lot of things which you can't measure and shouldn't bother measuring on the person like arm length and stuff like this. You just have to judge it off the posture of the rider and how they feel. You're looking for a relaxed elbow position, no projection of the shoulders forward, back, up or down. They should be relaxed and very little weight on the hands. And, it, and just experiment with it. It's one of the easiest things to change. Just, oh, I'll just drop the bars low, you know, take the top cap off, lower the bars 20 mil and just see, how, see if it feels better or worse. And experimentation with the front end, once you've got the back end pretty close, you should be able to isolate out the, the two, two, two different sensations, you know, because you drop the bars and it does change the position of the rider's pelvis and all this kind of stuff. So if you make a huge change to the front end, you may need to alter the rear end secondarily to that yes yeah so if, imagine you 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 decide that you want to run your bars 30 millimeters lower because you found out that that's where you feel the lightest on your hands as you do that most riders will roll their pelvis further forward on the seat which brings the pivot point of the hip forward and down relative to the crank mm. so the seat may need to go up and back slightly when the bars go down mm. yeah so once you got the front end pretty close go back and tweak the rear end using the same techniques that we just described if you've made a big change yeah, if you've made a five millimeter change to the front end, it's it's not going to be enough to make a big difference to the back. But if you drop the front 30 mil, you're going to need to probably go up and back a little bit on the rear compared to when the bars were higher. It's like a like a jigsaw puzzle. It's all it's all linked. Yeah, it's part of the fun. Yeah. <laughs> so look, those are the three the three things, and these this is like a dramatic oversimplification. And there's so many holes in these things that I could pick even with my own argument. Yes. But if you're trying to do it yourself, you know, judge it off mostly what it feels like but don't be afraid to use a bit of footage you know you get your get your other half to film you and go gee i'm really losing control of the stroke there maybe i should try lowering the seat you know or or wow i'm dropping my heels ridiculously i should try running a more rearward cleat position here you can reference back to that video we did on cleat position yes um you know so you can you can tweak it within those within those uh parameters if you think if you look at your footage of yourself and think i'm a bit of an oddball i look a bit weird in that way or you know i'm way too stretched out it doesn't feel too stretched out but i look like i'm projecting my shoulders forward and locking my elbow try running a shorter stem 20 mil shorter just see if it feels better you know mm. borrow one from your mate and chuck it on and see how it feels and um, yeah, hopefully with a bit of experimentation, devote a couple of hours to it, you know. Most people don't even do this, just jump on their bike and ride and, you know, tweak it occasionally here and there. But sit yourself down with a trainer and devote a bit of time to it because it is, it is worth doing, getting it roughly right. It'll dramatically limit your chance of injuries um, and, you know, hugely improve your comfort if you're a long way off where you should be.